Vital Signs Lecture. Vital signs, they reflect a person's state of health and hemostasis. The cardinal signs for vital signs are TPR, meaning temperature, pulse, and respirations, and BP, also known as the blood pressure. <clears throat> Anthropometric measurements, these are considered the following, height, weight, BMI, head circumference, chest or waist circumference, and any other body measurements. More and more we are seeing waist circumference as insurance companies are requiring this in the annual wellness visits. <clears throat> Vital signs. Even though you will do them routinely, accuracy is essential because it indicates change in general health, say a fever, or an elevated blood pressure. Treatments are based on vital signs. So if somebody has routinely had low blood pressure and all of a sudden has high blood pressure, we might recommend methodologies of different dietary needs or if severe enough, patients will be put on medications that they might not necessarily need. It is a very crucial aspect for the correct diagnosis. We should never be careless or indifferent when taking vital signs. I also urge new medical assistants not to cheat. And what I mean by this is a lot of the electronic medical records have the previously recorded vital signs available to you when you are taking your vital signs. I typically do not look at those until after I have taken the vital signs on the patient. Therefore, I don't have expectations of where it should be because that might not be accurate. Baseline vital signs are important to get a baseline, an average or a usual number for the patient. You can then make some comparisons. Has there been a change in health. You must accurately chart vital signs. So when we chart a pulse, it is P and then the number and beats per minute, BPM after. For respirations, we have an R, the number, and then a slash per minute. Then the blood pressure has the systolic, so the top number, by a slash, the bottom number, which is diastolic, which arm it was taken in, and was the patient sitting, and was it upper or lower arm. Those are all very important things that we need to record as a medical assistant. You must use good aseptic technique even though it is not an invasive procedure. Studies show that bacteria is spread from one patient to another via healthcare workers' hands and after vital signs were done. So make sure you are alcoholing your stethoscope in between each patient. A lot of facilities have gone to having boxes of alcohol wipes right where the medical assistant or the physician is going to listen to the heart and lungs or take that blood pressure. So we remember to sanitize prior to using it on that patient. Aseptic technique, clean your equipment before doing the blood pressure. Clean earpieces, clean the diaphragm and the bell of the stethoscope. Clean the blood pressure cuff or sphygmomanometer. So this slide shows what we got off of somebody's earpieces of a stethoscope. We actually cultured what we took a swab off of somebody's earbuds. And this is what grew. Lots and lots of bacteria. So it's very important to clean our earpieces and clean the bell and diaphragm. After cleaning, this is what we got with simple alcohol. Nothing, no bacteria. So just that simple step really eliminates what we can find. 
This is off of a blood pressure cuff before cleaning. That's kind of gross. This is after. And these little spots are just environmental mold particles that have floated into the into the agar. So very little bacteria grew after a simple cleaning. Something so simple that we can do it to prevent the spread of disease. So which one of those petri plates would you want when you are taking care of your loved one? I would certainly hope the one that didn't grow bacteria. So we move on to temperature. Temperature is the body temperature is a balance between the heat lost and the heat produced by the body and is measured in degrees. It can be either Celsius or Fahrenheit. A lot of your electronic medical records will automatically convert these. We will show you how to convert the long way just in case that electronic medical record might not work that day. The increase in body temperature is thought to be the body's defense reaction to inhibit the growth of some bacteria and viruses. Factors affecting temperature is age. Temperature of infants and young children fluctuates more rapidly. Aging adults are more susceptible to hypothermic or hyperthermic reactions. Stress and physical activity increase the metabolic rate causing an elevation in temperature. Women have fluctuations in temperature throughout their menstrual cycle. And smoking, drinking hot fluids, and gum chewing can temporarily elevate the oral temperature. So it's really important prior to taking that patient's blood pressure before you stick the thermometer in their mouth to ask if they've had anything to eat, drink, or smoke, or have chewed gum in the last 20 minutes. If they have, we are going to choose a different way of taking the blood pressure, or taking the temperature, excuse me. So if they have, we would take the temperature um, as a temporal artery temperature, so scanning across that temporal artery, or we could do an axillary temperature. However, axillary temperatures are about one degree less than every other temperature that is taken. Or we could do a rectal temperature, however, that is really invasive and you risk the chance of perforating the rectum by doing a rectal temperature. Oftentimes we do not do these a ton anymore, especially since the new technology with the temporal artery temperatures. Fever. Febrile pyrexia are terms of fever. Continuous fever rises and falls only slightly during the 24 hour period, but remains above average of the normal range. Intermittent fever comes and goes, and it spikes, then returns to average range. Remittent fever has a great fluctuation, but never returns to the average range. It is constant fever with fluctuating levels. Temperature considered febrile, so rectal, temporal, and aural temperatures over 100.4. Oral temperatures over 99.5 and axillary temperatures over 98.6. Fever of unknown origin is a fever over 100.9 for three weeks in an adult and one week in children without a known diagnosis. Temperature readings, axillary temperatures are approximately one degree lower than the accurate oral reading. Oral reading. The tympanic temperature is an accurate method because it records the temperature of the blood that is closest to the hypothalamus. However, we would not want to do a tympanic or auroral temperature in a patient who has impacted cerumen or a bilateral otitis media or bilateral otitis externa. That would hurt. Temporal artery readings are more accurate than tympanic measurements for identifying elevated temperatures in infants. Pediatricians may prefer either a rectal or a TA temperature on an infant suspected of having a fever. 
we almost always do TAs for infants or a rectal. In some children, if we can't get a TA or a TA is not available and we can't get an oral, some physicians will even do an auxiliary temperature over a rectal. It really depends on the provider. Care must be taken with rectal thermometers because of the possibility of rectal perforation. So we have different types of thermometers. We have the digital thermometers and that's for the oral. So the red tops on the digital thermometers, that is for a, and oftentimes these digital thermometers look very much alike, but the oral ones will have a blue color or a blue top on them. And the digital thermometers for a rectal will have a red top, and you cannot interchange the two of them. So I don't want anybody sticking a rectal thermometer in somebody's mouth. A tympanic or auroral is for the ear. Temporal artery scans across the forehead and down under the ear. The auxiliary is for the armpit and that has to be on bare skin and we have to close the armpit as tight as we possibly can. And oftentimes we have those disposable thermometers for at home use for patients. The pulse is the distension of an artery caused by a wave of blood being pushed through. One heartbeat equals one pulse. The average adult pulse is 60 to 90, preferably 60 to 80 is the range that we would like people to be in because that is less stress on the heart. The pulse, however, in athletes will be slower. Many times your marathon runners will have a pulse of 40. So there are some variances. However, that is normal for that particular patient. However, for the average patient, that is not normal. And the reason why those pulse rates are lower is because the consistent exercise strengthens the myocardium, so more blood is pushed out and there is less need from the body to get oxygenated blood out through into the other body parts. The pulse is also faster in children, depending on age. The smaller, the younger you are, the faster your pulse rate. As we age, our pulse decreases. There are different pulses in the body. You will want to be aware of where you can find these. So the temporal artery is on the side, just behind, just off the side of your eye a little bit actually closer to your eyebrow. You will feel your temporal artery, your carotid artery, just under the jawbone on the side of the neck. Your brachial artery will be on the inter side of the arm, so on the pinky side of your arm when you have your palm up. Your radial artery will be just before your thumb on your thumb side. Your popliteal will be just behind the knee, and your posterior tibial will be just above the ankle. You will be able to feel a pulse there, and the dorsalis pedis is on top of the foot. Characteristics of the pulse. So, pulse is always recorded in beats per minute, or BPM. We often use the abbreviation. We also record the rhythm, whether it's regular or irregular, and the volume or the strength. So a three plus pulse is full and bounding, two plus pulse is normal pulse, and a one plus is a weak, thready. These are the pulses that are a little bit hard to find. And this is all dependent on the condition of the artery wall. Is there atherosclerosis there? Pulse deficit is the difference between the apical pulse and the radial pulse. The apical pulse is taken at the apex of the heart, so along the fifth intercostal line at uh, just below the nipple. 
usually about mid-clavicle um, as a point of reference. So we take an apical pulse when there is an irregular pulse, when somebody's skipping beats or there might be pauses in that pulse, we would take an apical pulse because those are taken for a full minute and that ensures the most accuracy. So a pulse that is taken for a full minute is the most accurate way. So differences in pulse is the apical pulse versus the radial pulse. And oftentimes this happens when there is atherosclerotic disease. There might be a blockage. Um, I've only had a few patients with a pulse deficit in my life um, working in cardiology. And those patients have had a blockage in their subclavian. Um, we oftentimes call that a subclavian steel where there might not be blood flow getting to that arm. Um, or there are patients with peripheral vascular disease where it has affected the arms. A lot of times peripheral vascular disease mainly affects the legs though. The apical pulse is taken at the apex of the heart, listens with a stethoscope. Taken at mid-clavicular at the fifth intercostal space, just below the left nipple at the bra line of a woman, and it is taken for one full minute. It is charted as AP, the number you got, slash minute. And the reasons why we take it, we take these on infants and small children all the time, in patients with cardiac meds or with arrhythmias. Here in the Wasa area, Cardiovascular Associates does apical pulses on all of their patients. And that's because those patients have a high tendency of an arrhythmia when they are being seen in cardiology. Respirations, one cycle of respiration, so one inhalation and one exhalation equals one respiration. Respirations primarily under chemical control of oxygen and carbon dioxide is controlled by the mandula obligata in the brain. So we need to take the respirations without the patient knowing. So what we do is we take the pulse for 15 seconds and we keep our hand where we are taking the pulse, and after that 15 seconds is done, we then will count the respirations for 30 seconds. And then after you have taken both, you will then multiply your pulse by four and your respirations by two. The normal adult respirations are 12 to 20. And characteristics of respirations are rate, so children are obviously faster along with the pulse. And rhythm, infants are normally irregular. Sometimes you will have what's called um, sinus arrhythmias where how the patient breathes in infants will affect the pulse rate. So you need to be aware of that. And a lot of times the respirations will be inconsistent. And also we consider the depth. Patients with emphysema might not have respirations that are as deep as somebody that is of normal age or does not have disease. Respiration terms. So dyspnea, COPD, bradypenia, meaning slow respirations, apnea, meaning no breathing, tachypnea, meaning rapid respirations, also hyper, hyperpenia, hyperventilation, orthopnea, where somebody has positional um, shortness of breath or has troubles breathing based on their position, maybe lying flat. Rails, ronchi, and stertoris. Cyanosis and wheezing are all terms of respiration.